and has expired, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do want to first challenge just one of the misleading talking points that our colleagues across the aisle and their witness have been pushing today, that the existence of pregnancy crisis care centers is somehow evidence that the anti-abortion movement actually cares about mothers and families. It's just not true. In fact, these crisis pregnancy centers are a well-funded arm of the anti-abortion movement that advances their agenda by using deceptive and coercive tactics and medical disinformation to target low-income people facing unintended pregnancies to prevent them from accessing abortion and contraception. These crisis pregnancy centers, which actually outnumber abortion clinics, often misleadingly present themselves as providing medical services when they're not licensed to do so and therefore are not bound by the privacy laws that govern medical providers. And in fact, these anti-abortion facilities collect sensitive medical and personal information and then share it with anti-abortion organizations. These crisis pregnancy centers face limited public accountability despite the fact that they are increasingly siphoning off public funds from the TANF welfare programs, which are supposed to serve low-income women and families. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent to introduce a study by the Alliance of State Advocates for Women's Rights and Gender Equality entitled Designed to Deceive, a study of the crisis pregnancy center industry in nine states, including Pennsylvania. Without objection. Thank you. Returning to the subject at hand, we're here in the wake of the deeply unpopular Supreme Court Dobbs decision to overturn Roe versus Wade, and with it, 50 years of settled law regarding the fundamental privacy right of women to make their own decisions regarding their own health care. I don't think we can underestimate the impact that the Dobbs decision will have upon the health and welfare of women in their families in this country, and upon the economic health and welfare of this country as a whole by giving the green light to states to ban abortion, as many have rushed to do in the wake of this decision. And the suggestion that the decision has now been left to the people is fundamentally disingenuous, given the fact that the Senate is blocking any such legislation with the filibuster. The Dobbs decision goes against the values of a strong majority of Americans, that a woman should have the essential freedom to decide when and if to bear children, and how many, and that politicians should not be in the business of mandating that women carry dangerous or unintended pregnancies to term. The vast majority of Americans understand that we don't need or want politicians invading our doctor's offices, and that a woman's privacy, uh, invading our doctor's offices or a woman's privacy to impose an extremist minority view. When the reality is these decisions are complicated, they're complicated by the mental and financial health of a family, they're complicated by the physical health of both the woman and the fetus, they're complicated by whether or not the pregnancy was the result of abuse or criminal activity, and they're complicated by the fact that our society for decades has prioritized the well-being of unborn fetuses over that of children and families and even the health of pregnant women. So unfortunately, the ramifications of this extremist decision do not end there. In overturning Roe versus Wade, the court has called into question a host of other privacy rights that Americans have relied on for more than half a century, including the right to obtain contraception, the right to interracial and same-sex marriage. Professor Murray, many of my constituents have questions about the ramifications of Justice Alito's decision and Justice Thomas's concurrence in Dobbs with respect to these fundamental privacy rights beyond a woman's freedom to make her own reproductive health care decisions. Can you help us explain in plain English why those opinions uh, raise alarms about other fundamental rights of self-determination? Happily, um, those opinions all proceed from the same grant of liberty in the 14th Amendment. Um, this grant of liberty, as I said before, comes from this Reconstruction era, the Reconstruction Amendment's commitment to an anti-slavery ethic, including providing the formerly enslaved with rights of bodily autonomy, control over their own reproduction, and of course, the ability to control their family lives. Um, when Roe was overturned and the right to privacy was casually dismissed by this conservative secretary supermajority, it unsettled all of these precedents. And the majority's efforts to confine its decision to just abortion is frankly gaslighting. Um, there is no way to confine that logic to just abortion. If Roe is egregiously wrong because it is not rooted in the traditions of this country and because it is not explicit in the text of the Constitution, 
all of these other rights are equally in, in peril. Um, all of them proceed from the same logic and they are all on the same path as Roe is. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Uh,